In the 1970s, it was virtually unheard of for women to be victims of domestic violence. Now, I don't mean to say that it didn't happen. I mean you didn't hear about it. Women didn't talk about it. Medical and legal fields didn't address it. It was behind closed doors and largely unrecognized and ignored. But scores of women were being battered by their husbands or boyfriends. In journals of psychiatry, it was suggested that women provoked their own abuse. There were no shelters available for emergency situations. As a matter of fact, restraining orders didn't even exist until later in that decade. Toward the end of the 1970s and early 80s, the tide was turning. Women's shelters were being opened across the country, hotlines were open, and more and more groups were popping up to advocate for victims of spousal abuse. Today, the statistics are quite alarming, and not just for women. One in four women and one in seven men have been victims of severe physical violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. On a typical day, there are more than 20,000 calls to a domestic violence hotline. So listen to Melody and Darlene discuss a case that had a huge impact on how society handles domestic violence today. But also, consider that your trigger warning. Hello. Hey. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. So, anything going on in your life to share? Why don't you tell our listeners what we what you just got to see? My daughter-in-law, Riley, and my son, Isaiah, just came over to show me the ultrasound for my second grandbaby. Yay. I'm and I'm so excited. And I was lucky enough to be here during that time. So I got to see it too. Yes. And you got to see Ailey May. I did. And she <laughs> is a little bundle of joy. Yes, she is. She is precious. So yeah. we are super excited. This, it's just a little bean right now. But yeah, this new baby has some um, a tough act to follow. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. <laughs> so here's a question. To this Texas woman, did you hear about it? She was arrested after... A child was hospitalized by a drink that she gave him. Huh? Yeah. She put something in this drink. This kid drank it and had to go to the ER. And so she's been arrested. So she sounds like a pretty big piece of garbage, correct? Right. But there's more to the story. Okay. So what happened was her child supposedly at school was being bullied. Mm -hmm. And every day this other kid would take her child's Gatorade from them. Right. So she put something in the Gatorade. Okay. But it wasn't anything poisonous. She put salt, vinegar, and um, I forgot what else it was. Salt and vinegar and something else. Not anything deadly. Right. She put that in the drink. Okay. And so the next time that kid takes her kid's yeah. Gatorade, they got it, they drank it, and they ended up having, they got sick, and they had to go to the ER. Oh, gosh. Oh, it was lemon juice. Okay. Lemon juice, salt, and vinegar. So now she's been arrested for this. So what oh are gosh. what are your thoughts? I mean, I don't know. I don't think <laughs> I don't think it was that bad. I don't know that she should be arrested. I mean, I can see, you know, maybe she should have gone up to the school and like had it taken care of in another way. But should she be arrested because the kid got a belly ache for stealing her kid's drink? Nah. Right. And um, I don't know. She may have gone to the school before to complain about it. Okay. Because it does say that a school representative declined to comment on whether there had been any previous complaints of bullying involving hmm. that child or the hospitalized child. And, of course, they said, well, they can't discuss disciplinary actions. But yeah. I'm just thinking maybe she, she tried to resolve did. it that way. And I don't know. Anyway, I was reading. I thought, oh, this horrible woman put something in a kid's drink just to find out. I mean, I kind of thought it was a little clever myself. Yeah. I mean, that's not bad. I could see it if she like uh, put, you know, poison or x lax or, you know, something yeah. crazy that was actually going to make the kids sick. But yeah. if he got a little belly ache and puked well, or something. Now he did have or he or she, I don't know if it, if it was a boy or a girl, but they did have to go to the ER. And it like, I think it kind of was a serious reaction that they had. Like it, it wasn't mild. Right. But still. 
I mean, it was accidental. I mean, I guess like if something were to happen to the child, mm-hmm. um, you know, maybe an accidental yeah. man's, I don't know. But but she didn't offer it to the child. The child forcibly was taking Took the drink. It. That is so and true. And so, I mean, again, I'm not advocating that type of behavior. Obviously, as an adult, she should have handled it differently. Right. But at the same time, I don't kind of blame her. Like, yeah. No. You know what? <laughs> don't steal, um, you know, my kid's. Drink. Lunch. Yeah. Drink. Right. Anyway, I just happened to see that this morning and I thought, oh, that's kind of crazy. That was a, that's a good topic. Yeah. All right. Good, has, has good nothing to, topic. yeah, has nothing to do with her story for today. <laughs> just wanted to throw that out there. It was a legal type thing. So, yeah. So let's jump into our episode. Okay. Francine Moran was born in Stockbridge, Michigan on August 17, 1947. Have you ever heard that name? No, I don't think I have. You you may recognize this story once I get into it. Okay. She was raised by her mother and an alcoholic father. And at the age of 16, she met this guy that just captivated her, James Hughes. He went by the name Mickey. Okay. Now, at first, you know, she was smitten. And he he flattered her. He took her out for a good time. You know, girls, young teenage girls, we thrive on attention at that age. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you can fall in love with that person offering that kind of attention and uh, infatuation. And you don't, you know, you might rush into something. Right. And Francine did. Um, It wasn't long before Mickey was talking about wanting to get married. And she wasn't quite ready for marriage because she did have uh, dreams of going to college and stuff. But he was pretty persistent. Okay. And eventually he did wear her down and she dropped out of school when she was 16 to get married. As sometimes happens, it didn't take long for the shine to wear off Mm -hmm. of the relationship of Mickey and Francine Hughes. Okay. Mickey began to show his true colors. In fact, the first instance of abuse began on their honeymoon when Mickey didn't like the clothes that Francine was wearing and he ripped them off. He drank quite a bit. And at, over the years, his drinking got worse. But even at this point, he was drinking. And when he was, he, I've always said there's two kinds of drunks, mean drunks and goofy drunks. Yes. And he was a mean drunk. Okay. He would go into a rage very easily after he had been drinking. And little by little, that became more and more physical. And he would beat on his wife, curse, mm. yell, all of those things until he would pass out drunk. That's, that's so traumatic to have to live live like that never knowing like what you're going to do to make them mad yeah mad yeah I, yeah exactly during those years mickey and francine were also having children mm-hmm. they had christy jimmy nicole and dana dana's a boy so the two girls two boys over the course of maybe seven or eight years okay so they were having them kind of back to back and of course as those kids came along they were witnessing much of the abuse of their mother and of course, sometimes um, they would be uh, the victims sure. of it as well. But the mo- mother was getting the most of it. And even if they weren't in the room, a lot of times they would hear her sobbing in the other room after, or they would hear these altercations going on. And it's always so sad for children to witness that. Yeah. Just tragic. And not only that, but he would, Mickey would be spending a lot of their money on alcohol. And so many times, Francine and the kids would be really hungry. They didn't have food in the house. And so she would just have to make do with what she could. And her son, Jimmy, later when he was an adult, he remembered a time when his mom literally had to stir grape jelly into water to give them something to drink. That is so sad. And made popcorn just so they would have something to eat and drink. So you can just imagine these these circumstances of this home life were, were rough, mm-hmm. right? And fear dominated Francine's life. She couldn't go to the store for fear that it would upset Mickey. He was controlling, jealous, threatening, just always, like you said, she couldn't move without him saying it was okay. And she never knew what was going to set him off. Right. But she kept hoping if she could just stick it out, maybe he'll change. Because don't don't women think that like if I just wait long enough he'll get better at this and he usually promises that after of course. after an especially bad altercation right and they tear you they tear your self esteem down so low mm-hmm. that you just don't feel like you almost feel like you need them some exactly somehow right 
But he didn't change. And if he did change, it was really only by becoming worse. Right. Many times she would have to call the cops to their house uh, just to get help. And they would arrive. They would break up the fight. But if they didn't actually see Mickey hitting her, then, you know, there was nothing they could do. Even if it was very obvious that he had been beating her. her. Even if there were marks on her face, if they didn't see it happen, they couldn't do anything about it. Well, finally, in 1971, Francine managed to leave with the kids. She got some help through a welfare agency, and so she filed for divorce. Yeah. And she was able to get her own place. Once the divorce was finalized in April, she had set up house with her kids. Things were getting a little better for her. While Mickey and Francine were separated and she's waiting on the divorce, he would still come to the house, uh, you know, to get the kids and stuff beg her to come home and Mm -hmm. to come back and if that didn't work you know he'd be real sweet but if that didn't work then it would turn into more threats you know he was trying every which way to get her back and manipulating yes manipulating so the divorce went through and was final right but mickey was not giving up and so not long after francine had gotten herself and her children out of that situation mickey was in a horrible car crash that almost killed him now, uh, whether that was a drunk, I mean, I'm sure it was a drunk driving wreck. Right. But whether that was a manip- manipulation tactic or not, mm-hmm. we do know that afterwards he manipulated because he used his helplessness during his recovery to guilt Francine into taking care of him. And, you know, at first she was hesitant to do that, but right. she felt she like she felt had bad. to. Yeah, she did. She felt guilty. He was in such bad shape. And and it's the father of her kids. Right. And he guilted her into like, who's going to take care of me? So it wasn't long before Mickey had moved back in with her and the kids. And of course, it wasn't long until he was strong enough from a recovery and that abuse started right back up. Then this time it was actually even worse and it continued to escalate. Once Mickey choked her, ran her out of the house in her nightgown. And then when she got in one of their cars and tried to get away, he pursued her in another car and tried to run her off the road. Oh, my God. After that incident, she did manage to take a criminal warrant out against him. And she told the prosecutor then that she was afraid of him. And if nothing was done, that she was afraid he was going to kill her. Yeah. One time she had to try to have him committed to a mental institution. But once they found out that he had an alcohol problem, they wouldn't take him. They said, well, we don't we don't deal with that type of situation. So she couldn't get any help that way either. Well, finally, Francine, you know, he was controlling and jealous. But, you know, he has he is in recovery from the wreck. And I guess somebody's got to make some money. Right. So she talked him into at least letting her go back to school. And she was able to get her GED. And she wanted to continue her studies. She wanted to be able to get a job that would, you know, they were already living so in such a poor conditions. Right. They needed money. She wanted to go to secretarial school. And so she's going to want to take some classes for that. Sure. Well, we know what that means. It's going to, if she can work and make her own money, it makes it possible for her to leave him again. Right. And he knew that too. Yeah. And he wasn't happy about that decision. Mickey gave her a hard time. And he was just trying to make her life miserable so that she would quit school and quit mm-hmm. those classes. But when she persisted, then he started bullying her again about it. Then on March 9th, 1977, after 13 years of domestic violence, Golly. and they had been divorced for probably six or seven years, but he's still living in the home. She just couldn't get away from she him. She couldn't. She couldn't get him out. Once he got over the car wreck, she couldn't get him out of the house. So she stuck with him again. But on that night in March, everything came to a head. 29-year-old Francine returned home from class to find Mickey already drunk in the afternoon and very angry. The abuse began when she began preparing some TV dinners for her and the kids and Mickey. Isn't that something? While she's sitting there cooking, he's Mm -hmm. wanting to beat her. Right. He started insisting that she, well, first of all, he was mad because it was TV dinners. You know, she wasn't home to cook real food. But, oh, and so he's fussing about that. And he would refuse to let her cook it. He would be beating on her and not let her go in there. But she she needs to feed her kids. Right. So it was kind of going off and on throughout the afternoon. Okay. Then he started insisting that she quit school. And she just refused. She was right. not going to quit her classes. He was so mad about it. He ripped some pages from her school books and made her burn them. 
out in the backyard. Oh my gosh. And the whole time he's hitting her, pulling her hair, punching her in the mouth with his fist. Her kids are seeing this happening. So finally, in order to get the abuse to stop, she agreed, okay, I'll quit school. Why, even while he was beating her, she yelled upstairs for Christy to call the cops. Right. Well, when the cops arrived, they broke up the fight, but again, couldn't take him into custody. They hadn't seen anything happen. He was being even very belligerent to the cops during that time. And they, both officers heard him threaten her and say it was all over for her because she had called them to come to the house. We'll be back after a quick break. Ladies, I don't know about you, but over the last few years, Melly and I have noticed differences in our skin that have been pretty discouraging. You know, the inevitable signs of aging, fine lines, some wrinkles here and there, dull, dry skin and sunspots. Thankfully, there's a non-invasive treatment available without having to go under the knife. Tasha Bryles at Lakeside Integrative in High Point, North Carolina, offers a total skin package that includes radiofrequency microneedling and laser skin resurfacing that can be done right in her office in under an hour. It stimulates collagen growth and elastin that improves the surface and texture of your skin, as well as tightening it. The laser treats acne scars, minimizes large pores, and lessens if not completely fades sunspots. Melody and I were blessed to get this treatment in late fall, We're going back for our after photos within a couple of weeks, and we'll be sure to post them on our Facebook group. Melody was just saying how she felt like it gave her a fresh start for her skin routine. It even cleared up some precancerous skin lesions she had, and it faded my sunspots completely as well as brightened and tightened my skin. We're really thrilled with our results. Lakeside Integrative offers an array of other services for men and women, as well as fillers, laser hair removal, weight loss, hormone, and medical treatments. Don't walk. Run to the phone and call Lakeside Integrative to set up your appointment at 336-715-0007. Tell them Darlene and Melody from Hard Times and True Crime sent you. Why wouldn't they do something with, I mean. At this, this was in the 70s and yeah. there was just no oh law gosh. on the books that would allow them to do that. that there was nothing. Terrible. I wish they would have like patrolled or something. Well, he was pretty smart. He knew that he knew exactly that they couldn't do anything if they didn't see it. So okay. he had enough sense to wait. Right, right. And he was even threatening them at times. Well, after the officers left, Mickey's agitation grew worse. Francine once again tried to make dinner for the kids. Mickey walked through to get himself a beer. And when he saw them eating, he was furious and he sent the kids upstairs and promptly threw all the food on the floor. Then he twisted Francine's arm behind her back and made her pick it all up. When it was almost completely cleaned up, she had put all the scraps like in a pail. Mm -hmm. He picked that up and dumped it all back on the floor again. And made her, uh, once again, start picking it up, screaming in her face to get it up. And he picked up some of the food. He was smearing it on her back and in her hair, just humiliating her and treating her like a piece of garbage. He told her, well, if you think things are bad now, they're going to get worse. And the children, they were upstairs. They could hear her crying from their rooms. And they were calling out, Mom, are you okay? That is so sad. So very sad. Afterward, when everything was cleaned up... Then he went and forced her to make him something to eat. Once he had eaten, he went to bed and he called Francine in there to him. And then that's when he forced her to have sex with him. And she did say that almost always after he would beat her, he would rape her. Mm. And I know some people say, well, they're married. It can't be rape. No, oh, it's rape. Crap, yeah, It's rape. If you don't have the option of saying no, then it's rape. It's rape and she yeah. said she never had the option. If he wanted sex, she didn't have the option. So that was just another form of abuse. Yeah. And of course, after that, he passed out in a drunken stupor on the bed. Once Mickey was passed out, Francine called the kids down. She told them to get their shoes and coats on and go wait for her in the car. Her younger son, Dana, was not home at that time. Some reports said that he was with a friend, Mm -hmm. but she just, she had waited and he hadn't come back yet. And she just decided she couldn't wait any longer. Yeah. So she sent the other three kids out to the car. She she had to leave, and she said this time she was not going back. And then she said suddenly she just realized, I'm not going back because there's not going to be anything to come back to. Mm. 
she got a can of gasoline from the garage, poured it around the bed where Mickey lay passed out, and fired it up. Wow. The room immediately was in flames. Francine took off out of the house, got in the car, and left and didn't look back. She drove straight to the police station. She entered the gate, and she was hysterical and stating, I did it, I did it. He was sleeping, and I set the bed on fire. When the fire department had arrived at their home at 1079 Grove Street in Dansville, Michigan, the house was in flames, and by the time they were able to contain the fire, half of the house was destroyed, and they found 31-year-old James Mickey Hughes's body. Later, it would be determined that he had died from smoke inhalation, and officers had no choice but to arrest Mrs. Hughes. Right. She was later charged with first-degree murder and felony murder in the death of her ex-husband. Wow. That's a, that felony murder is a big deal. It was a big deal. The trial was held in Lansing, Michigan in October of 1977. Francine pled not guilty by reason of temporary insanity. Mm -hmm. She didn't plead self-defense. So her defense argued that the relentless beatings drove her to temporarily lose control of her senses. And her case was actually one of the first ones involving what's called battered women's syndrome as part of her defense. So self-defense would indicate that she was protecting herself from an immediate danger. But she, yeah. But he was passed out on the bed. Right. So that was a good call. Yep. So when she set that fire, there was almost like a three hour window from the time of him beating her, raping her, and then passing out on the bed. She couldn't say he was actively threatening her. Sure. So instead of using that self defense, they went to the temporary insanity. Two of the witnesses at her trial were those officers who had been there earlier that broke up that fight. And they both confirmed they heard Mickey threaten Francine that he would get even with her and that it was all over. They did hear him make threats on her life. And, of course, they said he had been belligerent with them. And then came her mother-in-law, Flossie Hughes's testimony. Okay. Now, the in-laws lived next door to that property where right. they lived, where they were rent- I guess they were renting. Flossie kind of had a first row seat to all this stuff sure. that had gone on in the marriage. And she testified that she had never witnessed her son strike his wife in her presence. (sighs) Of course not. Yeah. She was defiant on the stand, sometimes actually getting in a shouting match with the defense attorney. Maybe that's where her son got it from. I'm thinking it is. She denied any knowledge of prior abuse from any of her sons. None of her sons had hit their wives. And yet Francine had had to go to her in-law's house repeatedly for help when Mickey was beating her. Wow. And yet this mother chose to take up for her son and act like Francine is the per- the horrible person for defending herself and her children. Right. They calling her a murderer. And- because how would she have gotten away? How? I mean, he she tried. followed her. He would have killed her. And he had, and he made that very clear. Yeah. And she did try to get away and she couldn't. And apparently the cops couldn't do anything. Right. Even after that shouting match that Flossie had on the stand with the defense attorney, she had to be taken to the judge's quarters along with both the defense and prosecution attorneys. And nobody knows exactly what was said, but the assumption was that Flossie got a lecture on her behavior and courtroom decorum. Good. So perhaps that was prompted by her response to defense attorney Gray Danis's questioning about an incident in which Mickey struck both her and her daughter-in-law wow resulting in francine filing a complaint at the sheriff's office before and when she was asked about that in court she fired back at the attorney my son never beat on me how dare you this is why he's like he is yeah she has pet him his whole life i mean it's obvious the boy's never probably had his butt tore up right and she probably always Got him out of him and got him out of trouble. Yep. Yep. Never made him face any consequences. Mm -hmm. We're kind of on this kick on our last several episodes about these consequences. (laughs) Consequences, But again, we're seeing it come out into play here. The Hughes's two older kids, Christy, age 12, and James, age 10, both testified as well at that trial. Both of them testified to seeing their father strike their mother several times on the day of the fire. Christy said, yeah, he had actually hit her many times over the years. And their testimony directly contradicted that of their grandmother, Flossie. 
I'm sure. Both children testified to events in which Mickey was beating on Francine in the presence of Flossie on more than one occasion. Under questioning, both children stated, after their father had gone to bed on March the 9th, Francine had asked Jimmy the combination for the lock on their garage, and that's where their gas cans were kept. And later, they both said they saw a can of gasoline near the back door after Francine had asked for the combination. Okay. And again, we're not trying to... She's already admitted to doing yeah, it. So there's, it. We know that. There's no question about that. The prosecution tried to paint the motive as a love triangle. Uh. They presented letters in court from Francine to an unnamed man that were a little bit romantic in nature. Okay. Francine did answer questions about that by saying that she was feeling very lonely and dejected, mm-hmm. you know, and here came somebody who made, him, made her feel good about herself. Right. She said they had only gone out once, and then she found out um, he was actually still married. Okay. She cut that off. And she wasn't married to Mickey. Anyway, right. she's not she's a married allowed. woman. Yeah. She's trying to get him out of her house. Sure. So she has a right. I mean, this was years later after their divorce. Mm-hmm. Hughes had the support of the feminist groups at the time. They were kind of hoping that the case would set a legal precedent for women to defend themselves against domestic violence. Right. In early November of 77, the 10 woman, two man jury found her not guilty by reason of insanity. I'm so glad. Yeah, I, I am too. This was after a two week trial and they only deliberated for six and a half hours. Wow. Francine did go on to later remarry. It, it was a country music singer named Robert Watson. Really? Now, I had not heard of him. Yeah, me either. And maybe he didn't hit it big, but yeah. he had been a country music singer. You'll have to ask your mom if she's oh, well. ever heard of him. Francine did go back to school, and she became an LPN. Oh. She worked as a caregiver in nursing homes. She was able to raise her children in a home that was free from any further domestic violence. And then the kids have actually grown up now, and they've spoken out as adults about the abuse that their mother suffered at the hands of their dad. I mean, it affected them. Of course. Mickey's family, um, his brother and father, both went on to take their own lives. Wow. And the family believes it's due to the fallout from Mickey's death. Mm. But you know what? I mean, they've sown these seeds. Yes. And that's not her fault. It's not. It's hard to feel sorry for them. So, in 2017, Francine Hughes died at the age of 69 due to complications from pneumonia. I don't know if her story, did any of that sound familiar to you? No. uh -uh. Okay, well, there was a movie made about it in 1984 starring Farrah Fawcett. Really? The Burning Bed. Wow. Oh, my gosh. That movie was viewed by more than 75 million people. Wow. And it was actually based on a book by the same name that had been published in 1980 by Faith McNulty. Okay. Also, so this story has really impacted our culture. Yeah. Folk singer Leon Hardy wrote a a song about it. You can find it on YouTube, and I will put it in the show notes. It's called The Ballad of Francine Hughes. Oh, my gracious. But here's something I don't, this is, this is like the real kicker. NPR has stated that that song, Independence Day, uh, made popular by Martina McBride. Yes. Was written about the plight of Francine Hughes. Wow. Probably the most noteworthy impact, though, has been the legal changes that came about. Now, when it's argued that a woman's persistent victimization interferes with her mental capacity, making her unable to know right from wrong, is termed the burning bed defense. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Just talking about this story. I mean, we both agree she probably yeah. would have been killed herself sure. had she not done that. Yeah. Not that we advocate murder, but I feel like it was, even though she couldn't claim self-defense, I do believe she was driven to that. I do too. And she was in a different time um, because now, even though so many women are still killed, you know, when they try to leave, but especially in her situation, because it just seems like until he... Until they, I guess, unless he's punched her in front of them, there was nothing that they could do, you know, the authorities could do. But now they can. Exactly. Yes. Some of those laws have changed. And now we have restraining orders. Right. It has definitely changed the landscape of that now. It was an impactful case. And I, I am glad that, you know, I hate murder, 
but I am glad that she got off because I'm glad that her kids are left with her. We're left with her and not him. Right. Exactly. And and then I was thinking as I was researching it, but then, yes, the tide has turned. But now mm-hmm. we have this situation where women can make any kind of false accusation and they're yes. automatically believed. Yes. I think of Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. Yes. You know, she's made all these wild accusations about this abuse and sat in court and tearfully and dramatically right. described this and I didn't buy a word of it, Mm -mm. but some people unfortunately believe her because she's the woman. Right. Oh yeah. And that happens more often than not. Usually the woman is believed. So I feel bad for the men who are falsely accused. Yeah. So I I don't, I feel bad for the justice system that has to try to figure it out. Right. Because they're not always going to get it right. Right. They're, you know, human. Yeah. It's flawed. And you know, these cops arrive at these domestic violence situations and they're putting their lives on the line. Yeah. Anytime you get in the middle of a domestic violence, cops have been killed in those situations. So it's just bad all the way around. I worked in a um, domestic violence shelter oh, when I you? was pregnant with uh, with Isaiah. And those women, too, they're tough women. But they have they to be. They have to be to survive what they've gone through. So these are not weak, like meek, mild women a lot of the time, especially um, they they are in those situations with their abusers. And so outside of that, they're, they're not, you know, they, and yeah. so I think sometimes with cops and stuff, they can seem combative, Oh, um, but they're not, they're just, it's, it's a frustrating place to be. Mm. And yeah. so I, I know that, uh, yeah, I I saw a lot of that whenever I worked. I bet um, you did. And that, you know, in yeah. that shelter. And when a woman does leave, that's the most dangerous time for her. When yes. she finally gets the courage to get out and people say, why don't you just leave? That is literally statistically proven to be the most dangerous time. Absolutely. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's something. It is. Well, I do want to. So on that note, yeah, I want to give the National Domestic Violence Hotline number. That's a great idea. So if if you are dealing with domestic violence, and, and we know it's hard to get out, mm-hmm. but there are resources available that Francine Hughes did not have. Right. So here's the number for the National Domestic Violence Hotline, 1-800-799-SAFE or 1-800-799-7233. I will leave you with a few lyrics from Independence Day. Okay. I won't give you the whole thing, but... Uh, I I know most of our listeners know this song. It'll be hard for me not to sing it, but trust me, you don't (laughs) want to hear that. Well, she lit up the sky that 4th of July. By the time that the firemen came, they just put out the flames and took down some names and sent me to the county home. Now, I ain't saying it's right or it's wrong, but maybe it's the only way. Talk about your revolution. It's Independence Day. Let freedom ring. Let the white dove sing. Let the whole world know that today is a day of reckoning. Let the weak be strong. Let the right be wrong. Roll the stone away. Let the guilty pay. It's Independence Day. Those sure were some hard times. They sure were. Now I got no tolerance for men beating on women. And if you should find yourself in that situation, will you just make sure you keep listening to hard times and true crimes for lots of interesting ideas on how to make the problem go away and look like an accident. And if you're a dude getting beat up by your girlfriend, well, you know what you tell a woman with two black eyes. Nothing. You've already told her twice. So make sure you tell everybody you know, and a few people you don't, to check out Hard Times and True Crimes. Till next time, goodbye. Goodbye.